All right, guys. Because of the basketball game tonight, I know a lot of you were busy, so we decided not to do the live Zoom review. But I still wanted to go back and at least walk you through the Kahoot questions and kind of go over what you need to study and what you need to know. So let me go over to the Kahoot. So the first question covers weathering. And remember on your soil doodle notes that look kind of like this, although you drew it on your own paper. Um, there's three types of weathering, chemical, physical, and biological. I want you to make sure that you know the three types and you know a few examples of the three types. Um, and then we'll go to the next one. This one talks about permeability. Permeability is how fast water drains through the soil. But also, don't just know permeability. Make sure that you know what porosity means. Remember that porosity is the amount of water soil can hold. And then also know the term leaching. And leaching is when water drains through the soil, like in permeability. When water drains through the soil, sometimes it can, the soil can lose some of its nutrients because it goes out with the water. So when soil loses nutrients because of water running through, we call that leaching. And then for this one where it says, which of the following is needed for the green leafy growth in plants? Make sure that you go back to your soil doodle notes and you know what potassium is used for. You know what phosphorus is used for and nitrogen. So on those soil doodle notes, remember we discussed nitrogen is for the green leafy growth in plants. It's a major part of chlorophyll. Phosphorus is for plant genetics, seed development, and fruit development. And then potassium is used for strong stems, early growth, and to fight disease and bugs. So maybe if I gave you an example question that said um, a farmer's crop is really struggling with a boll weevil, which is a bug that eats cotton crops. What would you suggest to this farmer to do? Maybe you could say he needs to add some fertilizer with potassium because we know that potassium fights against diseases and bugs. Let's go back to Kahoot. Okay, so make sure you know those three macronutrients for plants, what they're used for. And then this one, I'm asking you a sample problem. So what causes plants to suffer a deficiency in calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus, and it slows down beneficial bacteria? If you go back to your soil doodle notes, this exact example is on here, and it tells you that excessive acidity causes this deficiency and causes this shutdown or slowdown of the good bacteria that plants need. But remember, this is where you may get a little confused. Remember that excessive acidity or high acidity means that the pH is low because low pH numbers, like 4.5 is considered an acid. So low pH means high acidity. And on the reverse where we talk about high alkalinity, high alkalinity means high pH. So try not to get that confused because I could use either term. I could say that your pH is low, meaning that your soil has a high acidity. Or I could use, basically I'm trying to tell you that I could use the term for high or low pH, or I may use the term acidity or alkalinity. So make sure you know how the pH numbers affect the acidity or alkalinity. Okay, and then doo -doo -doo. Um, Doodle Notes also told you that our optimum range for most plants is between six and a half and seven. So that's just kind of a number to remember. Okay, moving into the next thing. 
This one is showing you a picture of a transform plate boundary. Think back to the Oreo cookie tectonics. I think we were virtual that week. Um, but remember that you have three different types of plate boundaries. You have convergent, divergent, and transform. Remember, convergent is when they are pushing together. Divergent is when they are moving apart. And transform is when they are sliding past each other. So make sure you kind of go over the boundary types and some major landforms or events that they cause. For this one, this picture is showing you two plates pushing together. So first of all, we know that that's a convergent boundary, but when one plate sinks under the other, we call that subduction. And remember that that typically happens between an oceanic plate and a continental plate. Because remember that ocean plates are made of basalt. So it is a lot more dense of a plate. So when they push together, that ocean more dense plate is heavier. So it typically sinks underneath the continental plate. So that's just kind of something to review for that. Okay, transform plate boundaries. We know typically cause earthquakes, but I also want you to remember how earthquakes happen. So remember when those transform boundaries are sliding past each other, they don't have smooth edges. They're pretty rat they're pretty rigid. So sometimes they get stuck. And remember when they get stuck, all of that magma is moving underneath. So energy is building up underneath those plates. And when they finally break free from each other, the earthquake is actually a release of all of that energy that has built up. All right, number nine, back to talking about soils a little bit. Remember, that the smallest component of soil, silt is in the middle, and sand is the biggest. So kind of easy way to remember that sand is the biggest. Think about if you're holding a handful of each type of soil. Sand, you can easily pick out one grain of sand because it's so much bigger. But if you have a handful of clay, I don't think it would be possible for you to be able to pick out just one grain of clay because it's so small. So think about how you can sort out one piece of sand so you know that it's the biggest. All right, for this one, this is talking about the layers of soil. That's again, you're just gonna have to go back to your doodle notes. I want you to remember what order they're in or basically if I show you a picture, I want you to be able to tell me which one it is, but I also want you to know what the layers consist of. So I may ask you um, what layer contains weathered parent material. You're gonna have to tell me that that is the sea horizon. So make sure you go back and look at those soil layers. Okay, this is another one of those questions. So Decomposing plants and animals, you go back to here. This one consists of decomposing plants and animals, so we know that that is the O horizon. All right, this one, review how to um, use a soil texture triangle. So remember which directions you need to go for percent clay. Look at the direction you're numbers are slanted so it's straight here you go straight across for clay for percent silt you see the angle your numbers are at so you're going to go down diagonally to the left and then for percent sand you're going up diagonally towards the left and remember percentages always have to equal 100 so you could easily eliminate two answers out of this problem because you know 10 plus 30 equals 40. So you know that your sand percentage has to be 60. So you could eliminate the top two answers right off the bat, and then you just kind of follow along. So 10% clay, 30% silt, 60% sand, we know is sandy loam. All right, this one, 
make sure you go back and look at that atmosphere and seasons practice that we did. I think again, that was on the week that we were virtual, but on Canvas, I have gone back and graded those for correctness. So if you wanna go back and review that, see what you got right, see what you got wrong, that's a very good idea to do. But also remember that we did some atmosphere doodle notes. Those were on YouTube where I had you draw some different things. That one's also the one with the planet and the seasons. That was four parts. So if you need to go back into Canvas, if you didn't do those, which I'm sure some of you did not do them, if you need to go back in Canvas and watch those videos and go through those notes again, that'll be very helpful for you. Okay, this again goes off of that atmosphere practice or those atmosphere doodle notes. But we know the layer with the lowest atmospheric pressure is going to be the exosphere because as you go up through the layers, you lose pressure. So you have lower pressure in the higher layers, which would be the exosphere. Okay, and then this one, very, very important. Remember when we talked about convection, we know that warm air, warm magma, and warm water, they all rise because warm substances are less dense. And remember the opposite, that cooler substances sink because they are more dense. Okay, this one basically goes off of the last problem, but this is depicting a warm substance rising, a cooler substance falling, and we know that these circles are called convection currents. So remember this happens in magma, this happens in water, this happens in air. These little circle motions are very important to know. So we have warm magma rising, cooler magma falling, warm water rising, cooler water falling, or warm air rising and cooler water falling. So that represents convection. Um, also, I threw this word in there. I don't know if there's a problem with it in here, but remember that isolation means the amount of solar radiation. So if you have, if you see that word on the test, remember that isolation means solar radiation. Okay, we know that deserts typically form at 30 degrees north and south because this is where the dry air is falling. If you go back to your convection currents, we know that near the equator, that's where all that warm air is going to be rising. And then it takes it about 30 degrees latitude before that air finally cools off enough to fall. And that air that is falling, we know that cool air is typically very dry. So that is why we have deserts around 30 degrees north and south latitude. So make sure you kind of review that. All right, this is demonstrating the reason kind of why deserts are at 30 degrees north and south. So right here, that air rising, cooler air falling right here. So typically where your deserts are gonna be, where that cool air is falling. But this question is asking you for the source of energy for the movement of air in the highlighted area. So I've highlighted this spot right here, but our source of energy is gonna be solar radiation. The air and things right here are warmer because this is where the sunlight is more direct. So the source of energy here is solar radiation. Okay, this one. All right, the deflection of wind. So what I mean by that is why winds curve through the atmosphere due to the spin of the earth is caused by or called the Coriolis effect. Remember, that's what we demonstrated with the globes. Remember, you were trying to draw the direction of the wind, but as your partner or whoever else was at the table with you, as they spun the globe and you were trying to draw your wind in a straight line, it curved because that globe was turning, because the earth spins, is why our winds 
don't go in a straight direction. So I kind of want to explain that a little more in depth. Oops, I messed up here. So we know that air is moving because of our convection currents here. So we know near the equator where that sun is hitting very intense, we have this warm air rising and cool air falling. Now this is what initially creates our winds. And so down here on this line, the cool air moving over and getting warmer is our actual wind. So that's the reason that wind blows in the southern direction from 30 degrees to the equator. Because remember our warm air is rising and coming over. We don't feel this. This is happening way above us, but we feel this air. This is our wind pattern. So the wind is trying to go down here, but since the earth is spinning, as that wind is moving in the south direction, the earth spins and it curves it a little bit towards the west. So in this area, our winds typically curve towards the west as they go south. Same thing here, the cool air moving over and getting warmer, that is the air that we feel right here, it's down lower. And so this air moving north from 30 degrees to the equator, as the earth spins and it tries to move north, it curves because of the earth spinning. So this way it curves to the west as well. Okay, going back to Kahoot. Okay, this one, make sure again, this is in those atmosphere notes where I had you draw it and I walked you through exactly what the rain shadow effect does. So remember that the warm, moist air from the ocean is evaporating. And remember, if you ever go to the beach, you know there's typically always a wind blowing from the beach towards land. So as the wind's blowing this way, it's carrying that warm, moist air up and it's evaporating. But as it goes up, it cools off because we're going up and it's cooling. And cooler air can't hold as much water, so it dumps all of that rain up here at the mountaintop. And now after it's all rained, the air is now dry. And so on the other side of the mountain, we typically get a desert. So on that Kahoot question, this was demonstrating the rain shadow effect. So back, look at those notes for that, okay? This one is also in those same notes, um, the atmosphere science notes. This one talked about an inversion layer. So when layers of air do not mix and they trap pollution, it's called an inversion. Because what happens is our warm air and cool air is opposite or inverted of the way that it normally is. So if you think about it, typically the air closer to the ground is warmer. And as you get higher, say maybe you climb to the top of a mountain, the air is gonna be cooler up there. That's normal circumstances. But when we invert that, sometimes it happens in a valley or sometimes it happens along a beach. Remember I showed you a, um, a model of that. Um, so what happens when it inverts is that warm air traps in that cool air down lower. And since the cool air is, um, since the cool air is more dense, it can't get out past that warm air. So it traps all of the pollution in there. But go back and watch those videos of me explaining it or go back and look at those notes to review that. Okay. This one, and I think all of the net, all of the following questions are about El Nino, La Nina. Yes. Okay. So I know a lot of you did not watch the lecture for this because I think only half of you even turned in the worksheet that went along with it. So it's very, very important that you go back to last week in the module, I think it was Friday, and you watch this video lecture because it's me kind of talking you through this video on YouTube that explains what El Nino and La Nina are and what the conditions typically are during those times. 
So make sure for El Nino and La Nina that you know what happens to the water and the water temperatures. Make sure you know what the winds are like. So there is a question in here that says, um, what determines whether we are in conditions of a normal year, an El Nino year or a La Nina year? Remember that is those southeast trade winds. So those winds blowing up towards the equator that are curving towards the west. So those winds are what cause these conditions. So make sure you know what the winds are like during a normal year, an El Nino year and a La Nina year. Make sure you also know what kind of weather these situations cause and where they cause it. So in a normal year, what happens to the weather over here towards Australia and New Guinea, or what's happening over here towards the coast of California, Mexico, South America during each type of condition. So is it during normal conditions, El Nino and La Nina, know kind of what the weather is doing in all of those areas. And then make sure you also review the definition of upwelling. Let me see if I can find a right here. Cools the water. So remember when that cool water starts to come up, remember that upwelling is a rising of seawater, magma, or other liquid. We call that upwelling. Okay, so hopefully this will help you study Hope you kind of know what to study for the test tomorrow and good luck tomorrow.